The following program is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Every house has a story. Chances are, a prominent house in a historic neighborhood has quite a story to tell. 515 Grand Street in Morgantown's South Park neighborhood is one of those houses that everyone seems to know. The house was designed by Franklin Barber and built for I.G. Lazell in 1901. Before 515 Grand Street or any other South Park address, there was Morgantown. Like many cities in West Virginia, Morgantown is a river town. Morgantown happens to be a very historically important place because of where it's located. You can put your canoe in the Mon River and go all the way to New Orleans by water. There is a Morgantown because it was about as far up the Mon River as you could reliably, most of the time, navigate. Uh, it was settled by um, Morgan, Morgan's son, Zackle. The town itself was chartered by Virginia in 1785. The agricultural produce in the Mon River Valley in the 1780s was so abundant that a lot of it was put on flatboats and taken to the world market. This area was famous for its Monongahela rye whiskey, and it wasn't illegal then. It was highly sought after. And the reason people made whiskey is there were, there were no roads. You couldn't, you couldn't take a, a crop of corn to market on the back of a horse, but you could convert that corn to whiskey and make a nice profit. In 1867, uh, the state had a land grant to build a university. And the legislature had designs on putting that in Moundsville. But the people in Moundsville were horrified by the prospect of having to have a college there, and they begged for the prison instead. So Moundsville got the prison, Morgantown got the university. With the university, uh, Morgantown grew. By 1900, there wasn't any place to live downtown anymore. Morgantown was what we call a walking town. People lived downtown and they walked to their, their offices or their stores or their uh, banks, wherever they were. So there had to be ways to live close to downtown. South Park was the first urban de developed neighborhood in Morgantown. Uh, the, the main streets, Grand and Park, soon became very desirous addresses. The house at 515 Grand Street was built for Isaac Grant Lazell. Judge I.G. Lazell was, among other things, an early developer of the South Park area. The first Lazell to come to this country was James. Uh, James left Hingham, Massachusetts and came to Maidsville. My great-grandfather, I.G., whose father was James, I.G. lived out at the farm until he had graduated from law school. He rode his horse to town and would, he and the horse would get on the ferry and cross the river and he would come to town. He became a partner with Edgar Stewart in the practice of law on Chancery Row. Shortly after that, um, he married Nora Jackson, who was from Kingwood. And then in 1901, he started building the house. The family was wealthy because of all of the rich seams of coal um, out in Maidsville at the original homestead. So there was money uh, to invest in property. And so IG owned much of the property on Grand Street. He was the judge in a Morgantown for um, seven years and was very highly respected as a judge. For, for uh, a year and a half, he was the mayor of Morgantown. He was so civic-minded and really sincerely wanted to advance Morgantown and especially South Park that he you know, clearly loved very much. 
I have an example uh, of a postcard that he sent to a, a friend, and uh, it was a picture of this house. And the inscription said, uh, this is a fancy hotel at which I'm currently staying. I think he was a man with a sense of humor. And you know, not all attorneys have a sense of humor. IG did have six brothers and sisters. His one brother, Cornelius, uh, which he was very close to. Cornelius had 10 children, and the ninth of his children was Blanche, uh, Nettie Blanche Lizelle, who uh, many people will recognize the name um, as being the artist that uh, may be the most famous in West Virginia. My great-grandparents had two sons, my grandfather Donald, who was born in 1894, and then they had a son, Eugene, who was born in 1897. Eugene died when he was five years old. So for the most part, it was um, the three of them living in this huge house for all those years. There are treasures in most every town in West Virginia, grand old homes that have seen history. Lazelle's house at 515 Grand Street was designed by George Barber, a pioneer of both Queen Anne style and catalog architecture. George Barber was a self-educated man. Um, he didn't have a lot of schooling. He grew up in DeKalb, Illinois. He moved to Knoxville, Tennessee and turned to these pattern books and the mail order process to sort of branch out and get more clients. He practiced largely from about 1888 until about 1908. One of the things that I really liked about George Barber is he designed everything from three-room tiny little cottages to 15 and 20-room grandiose mansions. He really believed that an architect should be able to work for anybody, not just the wealthy or the upper middle class. He did uh, such a volume of work as a result of the use of the mail order process, um, there is an estimate that he did over 20,000 sets of plans for houses and commercial buildings over his roughly 20 year career. That's quite a bit of work for hand drafting and, and, and the tools of the trade. By and large, his real contribution is the scope of his work being a national architect. This particular house um, is of a design that was published by Barber. It is featured in um, a pattern book that he published called Modern Dwellings. This house is um, a Romanesque revival house. Most of the houses Barber designed were frame houses. This is a masonry house, which tends to make it a little bit more unique. I have found on many occasions, particularly in smaller towns, that the Barber House is the house of the neighborhood. And in particular, this house, um, I know that Isaac Lazelle was involved in the establishment and the building of the South Park neighborhood. He selected a spot on a main road that was relative to his prominence in the neighborhood and, and in the community, and he selected a house that he thought would, would show that. It's Mr. Lazelle's mansion. It tells us a lot about Mr. Lizelle and his vision. Uh, it's, I think, appropriate that the house is as distinctive as it is uh, and that it sits up on the hill. The, the size of it, uh, all the bedrooms, the, um, the dining room with the built-in china closets, uh, and then the, the porches that are, are so nice and lovely and the stained glass, it's all here. It says, 1900 beautifully. My great-grandfather, I.G., lived in this house until he died in 1936. So he was able to enjoy the home for, you know, 35 years. But uh, then Nanma stayed in the house until 1954 when she fell and broke her hip and just was no longer able um, to manage the stairs and, and such a big home. My dad bought the house in 1954, I believe it was, and um, I, I knew nothing about it until the day it happened, and um, we came and we moved in, what, in the summer of 1954? Well, we moved in here when I was in the fourth grade, so 1954, and we left in 1962. We came and looked through the house the first time, and 
came all the, all the way through it and up, up here on the third floor and this little corner room, I looked at it and said, this is mine. I really remember the stained glass windows, uh, a lot of the bay windows and the turrets. Uh, one of the kids in the neighborhood used to call this the castle. I, I never really thought of it as a castle, but I guess from the outside, it kind of looks that way. Every time I see mm. pictures of restoring old houses and bringing in clawfoot tubs, I think about this tub. It's a very nice one, although our father grew up during the Depression, and uh, he thought that having more than two inches of water in the tub at one time was a terrible waste. So this tub was not put to as good a use as it maybe it should At least not when, <laughs> not when he was paying attention. That's right. <laughs> it was a wonderful place to grow up. When we first moved into this house, there were only two houses on the block, and this house to the south to the north was here was, uh, wasn't here either, and we, we walked to school. The neighborhood was really nice. It was very peaceful. Uh, there weren't nearly as many cars parked along the road as there are now, which is a big change. I remember standing out here uh, shoveling snow in the winter and watching cars come sliding down the hill and crashing into telephone poles and had a nice big pile up in front of the house one time. It's an exciting thing in the morning. Most of my memories seem to center around what happened in the library downstairs. We had a lot of our Christmas celebrations down there and our first television that we ever owned in our entire lives was in that room. And way up there on the tallest chimney was where we had the television antenna. And it was, uh, Dad wasn't much of a, f a fan of uh, television, so he didn't want to buy uh, a rotor. So every time the uh, wind would blow real hard and the antenna moved around a little bit, I get to climb up there and point it back at Pittsburgh where, where we got our television from. This house was a lot bigger than the house that we lived in before, so it was a lot of fun to run around in here and think about what it was like when the judge used to live here. We always pictured them as being, of course, much more high class than we were and having the back stairs and we call it the maid's bathroom back there. It's always kind of fun for a kid with a lot of imagination. I lived here from 1963 at 515 Grand till I think my mother sold the house in 1974. I actually was lived in a little area called Hopecrest, which is right up the street from here. My dad had built a house there with four children. It got too small. My first memory is coming home from school, and my mother took a different route home, and she came up Grand Street. And I had known that we were going to be moving, and I said, boy, I wish we were moving into that house. And she said, how did you know that? And I said, oh, I don't know. She goes, yeah, we're moving there. So that was my very first memory. It had never been up Grand Street. I remember everything. I remember exploring every little part of the house. There was just always kids running around in the house. And I think that's what made it fun. In the late 60s was the first time, you know, people started skateboarding. So we would start up there on Jackson and skateboard down the, the street, which was ex very dangerous at the time to catch ourselves on the mailbox that was down the street. So we just had a lot of fun. We would run around the, the neighborhood and there were lots of kids. Morgantown has seen good times and bad times just like any city. South Park has changed as well. Over the years, South Park began to decline. Uh, by the 19, late 60s and 70s, an awful lot of the property in South Park had been converted to student housing and a lot of it was in uh, declining condition. The last several years I've driven by this house many times and was troubled when I knew that it was falling into disrepair and that you know no one was purchasing it. The lack of attention showed. 515 Grand Street suffered some water damage and the paint started to peel but structurally, the house remained solid. Well, actually, I've, I've lived in Morgantown for most of my adult life since, uh, since I came back from the Army and went to school, so I, I have always driven by here from time to time and looked up at this house and thought, wow, if I ever got a chance to, to do a house like that, wouldn't that be a great one to do? Kevin and I grew up together. We were very good friends growing up, and Kevin uh, called me and asked me if I would be interested in uh, having a hand in restoring a house. And about a year and a half, two years ago, it went on the market. So I kind of, I, I came over, took a look at, look at it, and kind of waited. 
and, uh, and as the time went on, the, the price went down, and it became something that I thought I could, I could pull off. So it all worked out pretty well for me. He brought me to the house here, and we pulled in the driveway. I thought, oh my goodness, what, what have I gotten into? And but as soon as I walked inside, I fell in love with it, and uh, I just seen so much potential in it. It was one of the original big houses in Morgantown, so it's been here the longest. It's got the history. People have known it through the years and have referred to it as the Lazelle House. To see something like this, which which speaks, you know, so loudly of, uh, of architecture and, and history and, and and what it used to be like around here. Um, you know, and see where it's come over the past several years and how it was neglected and, and, and you know, there was a water uh, uh, burst that we had because the owners weren't staying in the house and it damaged a lot of the house. To see those things, it just broke my heart. When I first bought it, um, I, I had no idea what I was going to do. I had just finished a house on the other side of town, got it right to where I wanted it, you know, and, and was happy with it. and um, And so, when I bought it, I'm thinking, you know, am I going to rehab this thing uh, and, and turn it into a bed and breakfast, or am I going to rehab it and, and sell it, or, you know, what am I going to do with it? And then the more I came over and, and was exposed to the house, the more I hung out in the house, I started thinking, man, I want to live in this place, you know, I, I really want to live in this house. So um, the basic idea was to keep as much of the original as we could. Uh, try to modernize it in some areas like heating and air conditioning for instance which it didn't have make it comfortable to live in uh, and make it efficient to live in but keep as much of the, uh, of the original character of the house as we could when you first came in the flooring was this black and white tiled flooring that looked like it was added maybe about 30 or 40 years ago and all of this hardwood that you're seeing here was painted white Every bit of it was painted white. And to see the, see the, uh, the paint on this wood, it was just, that was almost criminal. But that's, you know, 40, 50 years ago, that's what it was about, you know, paint it all. There's just, you know, so much paint in this room and uh, it's slowly disappearing, which is really neat. It's like every day you can see the paint coming off, you can see more wood and it's just, it's kind of exciting. I love the stained glass. Uh, it's not just here, but there, there's a couple of bedrooms upstairs and some other areas where there was stained glass, and I, I just thought that was awesome. I mean, it's beautiful. It was uh, reasonably well preserved. Very little damage. Uh, you know, you're talking over 100 years. I thought it was a big deal, and, and we got those removed to get them uh, preserved and, and refinished uh, so that we can get them back in. But to bring all that back and restore a little bit of history and get it back to where it was, it was really important to me. I, I just, that's something that I enjoy. And when I travel, I like to go and see historical places and see what, what the world was about. And I think that's important. We've got this beautiful dining area that, uh, that I'd like to use. It's, it's something that we've gotten away from, but um, I think that not only have we gotten away from it, but uh, tra traditional modern homes have gotten away from it. So you have more eat-in kitchens and, and that kind of thing, rather than formal dining rooms. The floors, um, that was part of what I mentioned earlier that got damaged by the water uh, break upstairs. So unfortunately, uh, the original flooring on this floor was damaged beyond repair. If you can imagine an inch and a half slat with, with uh, finish nails all in it, all put in my hand. And uh, I've got a real feeling that uh, before the water damage occurred that it was still in good, pretty good shape. And when, when, that, when the water damaged it, it tended to buckle it up and uh, it was unsalvageable and uh, that was very unfortunate. So we took up all the old flooring. Uh, what we have here now is just a subflooring, and, um, and ultimately it's, it's gonna be reproduced pretty, pretty well, I think. I guess the reason they would have called this a sitting room back in 1901, uh, if you can imagine, there was no TV, there was probably no radio, and so that's what you would do for entertainment. 
And so they would use the, the, um, the big bay there that had plenty of light from it. And I can imagine there was a few chairs that would, would sit there to give you plenty of, of light. I like to refer to it as the library. I know it's on the, on the original plans, it was called the sitting room. And, and I think they probably meant the same thing. It's got some built-in bookcases in here. And, uh, and so I, I envision this as a place where the family can relax, read. Uh, typically, you wouldn't have a, a room like this or the parlor next door. So it's, it's difficult uh, trying to figure out what I'm going to do with all these rooms in this space, but it's, it's a fun problem to have. It's, it's a challenge, and it's, it's a fun challenge. And back in the time this was built, um, kitchens weren't used the way that they are now. I mean, these days, uh, the family tends to congregate more in kitchens. Back in that day, the servants uh, did most of the work um, in, the, in the kitchen, and so it was more of a workshop area, uh, smaller, uh, not decorative. All of us who have uh, acquired one of these houses are reminded of, by our tiny kitchens that when these houses were built, they were built assuming that there would be maids and cooks, and it didn't matter what the kitchen was like. Well, we searched high and low, but we never found the maid and the cook, so we had to redo our kitchens. It had been remodeled along the way and uh, it had a real 70s look to it. It was almost like a maze that you had to walk through and it was the most claustrophobic room in the entire house. And the first thing I could think of was we got to get everything out of there. We got to open this thing up and then we got to start fresh and figure out what we're going to do with this kitchen. It had the uh, suspended ceiling in it so when you come from a 10-foot ceiling in the dining room you walk in here not only were the, the cabinets coming in on you, it felt like the ceiling was so much lower also. So uh, yeah, the first thing we did, we removed the cabinets and, and got those out of here. We tore the ceiling out to open that up just to see what we had. Got the uh, paint coming off of there, the spindles. Uh, those should be sent out pretty soon. Let's talk about the master bath. All right. All right, you feel okay the way the uh, shower's lined out here? As yeah, far that as the turned out angle? pretty good, the way we lined that up over there. I like yeah, that. Yeah, we've that's got your work. drain put in for that. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be the vent. We've already got the, uh, the drain waste and the supply for the toilet set up mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. And you're still good with uh, putting the clawfoot tub right here? Yeah, this is going to work nicely. Yeah, I like, yeah it's going like to be a good space, space to put that in. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be nice. All right. Want to go like on that. to the master bedroom then? Yeah. Certain rooms that just were what they were. And uh, this just fit perfectly for a master bedroom. It's got, uh, it's got a fireplace in it. Uh, it opens up right onto what, what is going to be the master bath, uh, which was once upon a time just another chamber or bedroom. On the other side of this room has a smaller chamber, which I'm going to make my office. So it, it works into a pretty nice suite uh, for, for a master suite. I'm a physician by training, an emergency medicine uh, physician. I, um, back in, in 2001, myself and, and three of my friends who, uh, who I trained with started up a company called MedExpress here in Morgantown. It's an urgent care company. And uh, we've since grown the company to almost 50 uh, clinics now. It's been very rewarding um, watching it uh, come back to life, watching the wood be refinished and, and getting back to where it should have been. Um, I, I've got no regrets um, and, and no disappointments. Um, actually, everything that I've wanted to accomplish in the house, uh, Jeff's made happen for me. I enjoy the challenge and I like to take something that, that is old, that uh, has real meaning to it, and try to bring it back to life and, and make it look new again. Uh, I just think that's a really neat thing. We've lost so much of the past that we, people are really afraid to lose any more. Um, and I think that's good because um, we really need to hang on to, particularly houses like this. So many people have grown up seeing this house and driving by this house and, and knowing that this important, prominent house has been here. For that to be gone, I think, would really, you know, a lot of people would feel a great sense of loss. It's a terrible thing to lose a cultural resource of any magnitude. Uh, when it's gone, part of your history's gone. And you can apply that on many, many levels. 
and certainly sturdily built old homes really deserve the chance to live again. I think I speak for the current generations of Lazelle's so that we are so happy and to be able to come and to see the progress and to know that you know it's lovingly being cared for and appreciated and that you know it's going to have um, a new resident and it's going to be um, alive with life and uh, beauty again is just a wonderful thing. When you go up Grand Street or Park Street or Jefferson and you see that these homes are being loved and taken care of and it, it just makes you feel good that people care for some of these, these beautiful old homes. When they have it restored, they say they're going to have a big opening and we plan to be here. I want to see what they do to it. I, I told them when they have the opening, I'm, I'm planning to come back. Jeff keeps telling me he'll have it ready for me next week. Um, but, uh, but uh, you, know, he, you know how contractors and these guys are. But, uh, yeah, I, the anticipation's already killing me. I uh, can't wait to get in here. This program has been a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting.